you would think that having such a beautiful king, <laughs> that you'd want him to be your king for life. You'd want him to be your king forever. He never lost a battle. He changed their economy. He, he en ennobled their lives. He cleaned up their lives, brought sense to their lives, provided for them, protected them, showed them how to win wars without even fighting through traditional means. They would just march. He'd say, march around the city each day. Just march around the city and, and then shout and the walls will fall down. I mean, he's the most amazing king no king like our king, no king like this king had ever existed before. And then there's a sad moment in history where the children of Israel said, we want a king that we can see. Other nations have kings that they can see. I don't know how they arrived at that. I, I picture something like this. This is what I, I, I imagine the children of Israel meeting up with another nation and they're talking about the standard of living and standard, how, how they live and, and how they function. And they said, well, what's the name of your king? They said, well, his name is I Am. What does he look like? We don't know. Well, surely someone knows what he looks like. Well, no, one's, no one's really ever seen him before. Some of our elders have seen his feet, but, and we've seen his throne, but we don't know what he looks like. And they said, you've got an invisible king? Yes, we have an invisible king. He's leading you and telling you when to move and when to do these things. And he's led you here. And, and yes, he, he's our king. And, and they said, well, you should see our king. He's got, a, he's got a crown that weighs 70 pounds, pure gold. And you should see his throne. And, and he, he has his rules for living. And he tells us how to, what to do. And it, just through conversations, it began to be an embarrassment to them that they wanted, they wanted a king just like everyone else. And it got in their heart, and they finally voiced it. And they said to the prophet, Samuel, who's the spokesman for the king, I could even hear a conversation that goes on like this. Well, how do you know he's really speaking for the king? He could just be making this up. He could be the one that's ruling over you and dominating you and telling you what to do. And maybe there is no invisible king. Maybe it's just all this guy controlling you through his prophecies. And anyway, they voiced it. They finally got it out. They said, Samuel, we want a king, a king we can see, a king like everyone else. All the other nations have kings. We want a king who will go before us and who will lead us. And Samuel got so angry. And he went before God. And the Lord said to him, uh, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me from being king. There's no sense of gratitude for all that he had done, they, that they had lost that. And they wanted a king, a visible king like everyone else. And God says, okay, I will give them a king. Tell them what he'll be like. Tell them that he'll take their best land for himself and give it to his servants. Tell them that he'll take their sons and their daughters. He'll take their sons to war when his pride gets wounded and his ego gets out of whack. And he'll just take your sons to war. He'll take your daughters. He'll take, uh, he'll take a tithe. They all, they all had to tithe to the invisible king, but that's how he provided the, the priesthood for him. They, he gave it all back to them through a priesthood. But he says, tell them, what, he'll take their money. He'll take their best land. He'll take their crops. He'll say, this, this field is my field and you'll not be able to do anything about it. He'll take a tenth of all your grain and you will cry out because of your king. So Samuel went and delivered this to the people and said, he, God's going to give you a king, a king you can see, but here's what he will be like. And he described it. You can see this in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Well, Israel got a king. The first one turned out to be bad. It didn't work. The second one was different. His name was David. And of course, David became a king 
like no other king. But David, David was unique in that in the, he understood that he really wasn't the king. I can picture David going at, out on his rooftop at night under the stars and he'd say, you are the king of Israel. You are the king of glory. And, and, and he, he said, I don't know how to lead your people. I don't know how to provide for them. I don't know how to protect them. And he would acknowledge the king. He'd go before the invisible king with his ephod and, and his urim and thumb, and he'd say, what do you decide? What, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to fight this battle? Well, no other king did that. Other kings just did whatever they wanted to do. They lived their own life. They did things their own way. There are 19 kings of Israel, 20 kings of Judah. Only eight of them were good. Most of them were wicked. Most of them led the people away from God rather than to God. They lost their battles. They, they became corrupt. They uh, lost, um, uh, the economy was broken. There'd be famines and uh, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to, how to win the wars. It's a very negative time very difficult time for the, for the people of Israel. And they began to cry out for God to be king again. Come, be king again, rule and reign, have your way, come be our king again. They, they had it up to, up to here with all these earthly kings that led them from one disaster to another. And they got so tired of it and they remembered what it was like when God was king and they began to cry out that God, that his kingdom, God, the king being in control, would come again. And God began to speak and began to promise and say, I will come again. I will be your king and I'll be a king like David. And I'll be a king that'll come and, and, and will rise up like David and lead you and it created this hope it filled this vacuum they looked at every king they had it was just awful and now they had a hope they had a promise that God would come back and be king again but he'd come back as a king they could see and rather than calling him just king they called him Messiah a deliverer a leader a king who would be shepherd a king who would be pastor a king who would be priest and all these prophecies started coming out that God was going to come and be their king again. And they couldn't wait. They, they remembered through their history what it was like when he was king. The economy was great. They never lost a battle. There's no disease. Now it's nothing but famine and disease and disaster and discord. And they wanted him to come back as a, as a king, a king that they could see. And God said, this is what will happen. And he put it in their heart as a promise that he'd come back and his kingdom would come.